everyone. I'm Jen Stevens, and um, I'm here today with Jennifer Moore, and she's sitting in for Bill Humphrey, who's off doing secret film things. And Jen, what do you do here at PPM TV? I'm a new employee at PPM TV, um, assisting um, with uh, development. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. And our special guest is artist Christopher Cook from Portsmouth, and he was the winner of the Spotlight Award for painting. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll start off just a little bit with how did you start creating artwork? When? <laughs> in the very beginning. Well, well, I started young. I was interested in art very young. And uh, then I, I, I have a lot of other interests too. So the art had to wrestle for a while with those, but uh, I, I, be I became a serious, I guess, artist in my teens. And after graduation from college, I went on to get an MFA in painting and graphics at the University of Illinois, and things evolved from there, but that's the beginning. Are you f originally from this area? Boston area, yeah. Oh, very nice. And what is your primary medium? Well, I don't have a primary medium. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I really don't. I mean, it's interesting. Some people call themselves painters. I don't call myself a painter. I'm an artist who paints, but I've done a lot of other kinds of things. Filmmaking, conceptual art, graphics, a lot of sculpture. I guess, you know, probably I'm identified as more of a painter than anything else, but I don't think of myself as just a painter. But if we find your award to give it to you, you're going to be happy to accept it, right? It says painter on it, but yeah. So you're like a renaissance man. No, exactly, but you know, <laughs> a lot of different things. I think that's one of the things about art that's fascinating. Um, you don't know how much you want to get into philosophy. <laughs> but I do. I think that artists come from with many different kinds of beginnings and approaches to making art. And I think that's one of the most interesting things about art, is the range and variety of things that can be called art. Mm. I mean, and I think that that's one of the reasons it stayed alive, because of its range and variety of inputs into the nature of human life. Who are some artists that inspire you? Excuse me? Who are some artists that inspire you? Well, I, I, I don't know. Well, in sculpture, I suppose, you know, this is a point, going to be a problem. I have a problem with remembering names. Oh. <laughs> so when you ask me who I like, I'll tell you a story. That's okay. I, we like stories. I, yeah. I couldn't remember the name of Willem de Kooning, and I often wanted to refer to Willem de Kooning. So I had to have a system to remember Willem de Kooning's name. And it's WD-40, because I use <laughs> WD-40, and if I try to think of this, I know who I'm trying to think of, but I can't say the name. Mm -hmm. So I say WD-40, and that gives me Willem de Kooning. Mm -hmm. yeah. That kind of thing. But, you know, I don't think my, int I'm interested in, in art that really changes the way you think and see things. I'm not interested in art, traditional beauty and that kind of thing. It's not that I don't respect it, but that's not my primary motivation. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons I got into conceptual art and moved back and forth between art about, um, of, that, of that whole ilk and traditional making. Because after working in conceptual art for a while, I really missed making things. Just m the act of making something physical, mm -hmm. missing the art object, and that led me back to painting and all the other things that I still do. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to think of inspiration just as from individuals, but anything that inspires you. I'm, I'm really curious about what inspires people to create. Well, I don't think it's easy to say. I mean, I, I read, we, um, both my wife and I read all, we don't watch television, but we read every day. And we read all kinds. Right now I'm re reading Nicholson Baker, oh, who I think is absolutely incredible. He's such a really interesting man. And I'm fascinated by his writing. And I just finished reading a wonderful book about a woman. Her name was, oh, I can't remember her name. But she... Uh, WD-40. No, w <laughs> it won't help, won't, won't help with her. <laughs> No, she wrote a book about taking her, her husband died and they had a boat, a 25-foot boat out in uh, British Columbia. She took her five children for 15 trips up through the waterway, through uh, Puget Sound, up in that whole area, and she writes this book about this. And it's not just about taking kids on trips. It's a stunning book. Wow. And my son, who is rebuilding a 40-foot salmon troll out in Oregon, found this book 
and he sent it to first to his sister, who got a copy from me down at Book and Bar, another great place in Portsmouth. <laughs> and so I've just finished it. Now my wife's going to read it. Wonderful, wonderful book. It's called The Curve of Time. Oh, that's it. Nice. Yeah, terrific. That's cool. And that must be near and dear to Jen's heart because she just recently um, worked at the library. Worked at the Portsmouth Public Library. Mm -hmm. But you asked me about, the, one of the things that I've always done is to work in series. And these series have continued over the years. So the paintings that we'll see in a little mm -hmm. later here um, are actually from a series that began in 1957. And approximately every 10 years, I will come back to that series. It doesn't go away and die. And so that happens with some series. Some series are just one shots. But other series go on and on and on. And we can talk about that when we look yeah, at the Yeah, how paintings. about we start looking at the sure. uh, paintings? That would be great. Okay. So Ooh, what do we see there? This is a studio, a view of the studio, with some recent uh, work um, from a series, as I said, this group was started in 57. And wow. approximately every 10 years since then, I would kind of come back to it. And so these are mostly new ones, but the idea of these paintings was generated from a formal concept of saying, I'm going to take a square panel, because I paint on panels, and I'm going to cut it in half. Because some art teacher at some point in my youth said you shouldn't paint square paintings and you should <laughs> ever cut them in half. <laughs> and that was a sort of a generating thing. But the, it's much more about the idea that how do you take two halves of a square image and somehow make something that's coherent. Uh, and most of these images in the recent uh, series are urban. Mm. And they, they are about um, different conditions of state and mind, as well as about weather and architecture and so forth. So there's nothing that's explicitly a picture of any one thing, but together they generate generally the feeling of some kind of a, uh, uh, an urban space. And um, they're roughly, well, most of them are four by four feet, but they have smaller ones too. I don't think Bill took pictures of the ones that were up above these, but. Um, okay, now this is an older painting. This oh. is 1968. So we're going and in the way back machine. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and I don't know if you can see, but the, there's a eel, it's called striper and eel. Mm -hmm. And the eel in the foreground, the striper behind, but the striper becomes the water, becomes a bay. In the, if you could see it clearly, it really functions oh, yeah. as a dual thing. And I was interested in that kind of flipping where you introduce an element which is apparently one thing but can be several things. Mm. Because um, I think that, you know, I remember a writer friend, John Young, used to teach at the University of mm. New Hampshire. Um, and I had a big discussion about uh, something which isn't clear. He said, if you're writing something, it has to be clear. And I said, no, it, it doesn't always have to be clear. I mean, you can bring up all sorts of interesting things about, the, about an idea by mm -hmm. not making it absolutely clear, yeah. but offering different approaches to making an image to suggest, I mean, ambi intentional ambiguity is what I used to mm. call it. And I think intentional ambiguity is great in all forms of art. Certainly it's true in poetry, it's true in filmmaking, uh, it's true in literature but not for John Yant. Did Professor Yant take your class, your, one of your art classes? No, I never, he, no, I, when I taught at the university a long time ago, I, before actually he was, he came to the university, I think, when I was first teaching there. Um, but we're good friends. Okay. Yeah, he did like creative writing and... He taught re writing, he's a novelist, cool. and uh, yeah. My other close painting friend, Art Mambro, who you probably know, he, uh, yeah. um, in fact, he's got a show opening down at the Lincoln Lover Gallery tonight. There had a recent at a show in North End of Massachusetts, a very fine painter, and he and I worked on a series uh, that was shown at UNH in uh, 19, 2001 on Great Bay. It's called, there's mm -hmm. a catalog of that. Th this is a, a couple of sculptures. The one on the left is recent. They're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It's bronze on rock. One on the right is bandsawed wood, 1960s. And um, all my sculpture gener is generated from bandsawed materials. So the one on the left, which is cast bronze, was first made in foam and then sand cast, burned out in sand cast over at the, at the, the, at the uh, gallery, the Green Foundry. Oh, over Sanctuary Arts. Oh, 
okay. They're doing a wonderful job there. They, they yeah. want a wonderful foundry. And so even the, these figures, a little difficult to see, but the one in the foreground is three figures that are movable. So this whole piece can be, you can change the whole mood or meaning of the piece by twisting the figures around or interchanging wow. them. And there, there's several holes in the rock base. Uh, Did you drill the holes in the rock? Yep. Yep. I, f I tell you, I was telling Bill yesterday, it takes approximately two hours of hunting down the beaches to find a rock that I can use as a base. To find a, usually I work from the sculpture to the base. Not always. <coughs> Sometimes I get a rock that I really like and I make a sculpture that right. works with it. Now uh, that's a bandsaw figure from the 60s on the left and, the, uh, and, a, and a bronze casting on the rock behind. Penitent did figure, so-called. Did you name them? Oh yeah, they have names. These are the guys, these, are, these, are, <laughs> these go way back. I've been doing these for over 50 years. They are all one piece, that is the figures are part of the block, they're not glued on or drilled in. Oh, wow. So you start out with a block and you, and you work with a bandsaw. In my youth, I, I did some dangerous things with a bandsaw, mm. but I've learned to be a little more <laughs> careful. Do you have your own bandsaw oh, at your yeah. house? Yeah. Wow. Well, I have a sculpture workshop okay. downstairs. <laughs> but, and that on the right is, a, is a, wax cast, a wax model for a casting that's never been cast. The figure in perspective, the figure is running down a wall. And I was interested in perspective because I hadn't seen a lot of sculpture that utilize one point or two point or three point perspective. The figure behind with the arms raised is a figure I say it's a picture of my wife. <laughs> uh, it's bronze on stone. Fairly recent work. Done again at the Green Foundry. And this is a wooden piece about a little over two feet tall. Uh, and it's, put to, it's made together with lots of pieces. This is not a single carved out piece. This is an assembled. I did a lot of those in the 70s. Uh, but its head is made of stone that was found at a beach in California that our daughter Esther, who uh, lives out there and is a chef teacher for uh, Alice Waters in her program, wow. um, Edible Schoolyard. She took us to this beach and found these wonderful rocks. I bought a bunch of them home, <laughs> used some of them. And so it's wood and stone. And the painting on the right is a, by a dear friend. The, this is a group of newer bronze pieces, cast and, and just shown as cast. Nothing's been done to them. They haven't been shape, well one of them, one of the figure and the woman in the back has been worked on, but the rest are just as cast and they're mounted on glass. And you really can't see it, but the glass is stacks of glass to get about an inch of thickness to the base. So the light, you have to put them, see them in front of a window, so the light coming through the window lights up the base mm -hmm. and really gives a different impact to the sculptures. And the, this is the one on the right, the little cast bronze, and the figure behind is another one. All these earlier bronze pieces, which I did at, at the Green Foundry, have rock bases. As I said a minute ago, they, the rock base is usually found after the figure is made. These have been uh, somewhat worked on. These are not just as cast. These are, you can see a polished place on the breast of the mm -hmm. woman on the right. And most of these series I call penitent figures, but they all are slightly bent. And I'm thinking those are images of people all over the world who you know, I'm not having a tough time. So that's why I call them penis and figures. They could be, well, I guess I'll leave it at that. Mm. I have a question about the larger piece. Is that meant for outdoors? Or which, which piece? The larger figures that can move? Uh, these, are, these pieces are, well, the bronze ones could be put outside. Yeah. But they're really not meant to be outside pieces. They're really inside pieces. Yeah. And they're not very big. The biggest ones are, what, 12? inches tall maybe. It's said the one big wooden piece that I talked about was two feet tall. But big sculpture is, what do you do with it? <laughs> you put it outside. <laughs> you, you put it outside, it. yeah, but I mean, honestly, um, no, I don't do big sculpture. Most of my stuff is small. Yeah. That's interesting. Where can people see your work? Well, mostly I've shown it here in this area at Mary Hardigan's in uh, her gallery in York. She's a real professional uh, curator. Mm -hmm. I, it's really very, very good to her artists and good to her clients. Very intelligent woman and a wonderful colleague. Have you been to her? No, now I'm going yeah. to look it up. We'll have to get over If there. you haven't been to her gallery, 
You should okay. go. Good to know. And this is kind of off topic, but important also. Where do you go in Portsmouth to relax? W my wife and I go out to the Common, the Newcastle Common, and try to go out every day. And the thing about Newcastle Common is it's different every day. The water and light sky colors change every day, depending on what time of day you go. It is really a beautiful place. I mean, I th it's really something. I just can't get over how it changes. Do you take pictures? Yep. You do? Okay. Yep. And do they, like, inspire you? Yep, artwork? sometimes. Okay. Yep. Do you paint f from pictures, or do you paint f outside? I, well, it depends on the, what the series is about. Like that series of the urban scapes? The, 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 all of the urban landscapes are all from the imagination and are based on okay. real places. But when Art de Bambo and I were doing this Bay Show back in uh, 2000, we'd, we worked three years outside around Great Bay. Uh, we went around the outside perimeter, everywhere we had total access to it. We painted outside in the good weather. Mm -hmm. We were planning to paint outside in the winter, too. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> That it didn't, didn't work out, out. <laughs> so we took photographs. But I don't generally work from photographs. Um, so, you know, how a painting or how an anything gets started is really hard to, to describe because sometimes you don't even know why you start something. Yeah. You just start working and something happens. And some of the times you have very specific ideas about what you want to do. Um, I remember coming when I was teaching at the University of Hampshire back in the late 50s. I was driving home to Lee where we lived at the time. And I came around the corner near uh, Leewood Arch, uh, Orchards, looking out at the T.C. Fields. Best potato chips. And there was a cloud in the sky. And I had yeah. a big canvas, about six by eight feet, on the studio wall at home. It was underway. I don't even remember what the image was. I came right in the door and totally painted it over <laughs> and painted this cloud painting. And wow. it's one of my favorite paintings of that era. And that was, you know, how did that happen? It just happened. It was just yeah. a thing that I saw this thing. And it was... Do you still have that painting? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So are you sad when you, when a painting is sold and you don't get to see it anymore? Well, this painting won't get sold. No one's no. going to buy a six by eight foot painting. <laughs> you don't Not know. Not for me. They could hang it over their bed as like the backdrop. You yeah. need a pretty big room. <laughs> okay. That's I mean, true. actually, that's another thing. You know, artists, younger artists are always told, you've got to paint bigger, you've got to paint bigger. I and mean, that's the way you get some sort of a reputation. And so everybody does paint big at some point or other, usually. And then you begin to have to deal with these things. I've got them in storage downtown. You know, I've got a bunch of big paintings. <laughs> but uh, my biggest one is in safe place. It was go it's gone to the Addison Gallery where I used to work in Andover. And that's a big, that's eight feet tall and up to 40 feet long, depending on how it's put together. By, it's made up of individual mm -hmm. panels. But painting big is exciting. But you can't always paint big, and particularly yeah. if you want to have stuff go, you know, be sold or why. Well, people can't accommodate that. Yeah. What did you do at the Addison Gallery? I was the director work? there, and oh. I taught painting there and other things. After leaving UNH in 1964, we were down in Andover for 34 years. Oh wow. Yeah, but we had a, we kept our house in Lee, uh, so we could go up in the summertime. So we were always in New Hampshire some of the year. Mm hmm. What do you think of opening receptions at galleries? Do you, do you enjoy them? Do you attend if they're Yeah, well, it's well, yeah, they're fun. You know, okay. you can't see the art very well, so you have to come back to see the work. I wondered. Okay. And this is something I've wondered about. What do you think of artists, um, of people taking snapshots of your work in a gallery? Is that, like, frowned that, upon? It, it doesn't bother me. I no. mean, um, it's, it's fine. Okay. If they want to like it well, I'll take a picture, well, that's, that's fine. Okay. And let's see. And this is also kind of silly, but what do you think of social media, like Facebook? Do you I don't you do it. You don't do it? No. Because you don't want it, because you don't have time, because... Yeah, I guess a little of both. Little I, you little know, little. I don't want to get tangled up in it. I, it doesn't interest me. Uh, if I hear something, someone tells me something, and I want to see it, certainly I would look it up. I mean, look it up and look at things on YouTube just because, mm. you know, someone said, you've got to see this. Right. My daughter, uh, Jordan, who lives locally, uh, 
is a works uh, volunteers at the SBCA. I know Jordan. You know Jordan. Yes. And, and Jay. And Jay. Yeah. And Jay studio house. that you know. Jay, yeah. Well, I have two <laughs> sons-in-laws who are photographers. Jay, and our other son-in-law Richard Howard is a. Uh, he does. He was a journalist, a photojournalist, but he does a lot of work for schools, that kind of thing. So they they, did, they have a different tack on. Uh, you know what photography means, but the funniest thing is at Thanksgiving mm -hmm. time they used to chase each other, chase each other around the house. They would get into some kind of a discussion at the dinner table and end up running around the house, arguing the whole time about what they had been. It was very funny. It was a family <laughs> kind of thing. Oh, that's awesome! I think your cats are from Jordan. Oh, Jordan. it's her! Cats. You oh, got your cat from Jordan? Yes. Jordan. Oh, so she's oh, yeah. the she grandmother of my, and we send her pictures <laughs> all the time, <laughs> and she really appreciates yeah. that. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I'd yeah. Like she to know that she is a uh, she raises incredible kittens. That's funny. I've seen many pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Do you um, ever complete a piece you're not proud of and have to like? Well, it's simple. Trash you know, it. after you make, f you think you're done. You don't rush out and show it to people. You let it percolate mm. and sit around, and sometimes for quite a while. And I found that I've thrown away stuff that I wish I hadn't, and I've kept stuff that I don't know why I kept. <laughs> so cause a lot of it is your mood or the kind of mind state of mind you're in when you look at it, and you say, oh, "I got to get rid of stuff." I'm going to get a lot of stuff. I was thinking, my kids said you should have a bonfire. Oh yeah. yeah. And take out all the stuff that you really don't. But of course, the trouble with that is. You, some of the stuff you'll burn up will be the stuff you later wish you kept. Yeah, that's true. Do you um, do you seek counsel from your wife? Oh yeah, I mean I have ever? sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she sees everything I do. Okay, is she artistic as well? She she is a yoga practitioner, and she has a class. She doesn't. She has a teacher who friend who comes up from Boston, and Julie and her friends have a yoga class in the above the studio in the house. Wow. So one of the reasons we got the house where we are is we could build a yoga studio, painting studio, and have a workshop in the basement. That sounds wonderful. Very nice. Do you have an upcoming show? Planned? Pardon? Do you have a show planned coming up? Nothing planned coming up, no. And the, and they, uh, I'm not sure how to quite respond to that because I don't really actively go out looking for shows. Um, People scoop you up; they come to you. Well, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's, it's a, if I see something or I hear something. For example, uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time in the White Mountains. We used to t work at camps and take kids through the mountains. Yeah. And we have relatives who work there. Our, our grandson Miles Howard has been working in the hut system for years, and my Mother's second husband was one of the first people to start the heart system, the heart system, the Appalachian Mountain mm -hmm. Club, yep. heart system, uh, and so we have a lot of connections to the mountains. And we've been thinking, we've been going up occasionally up into the Sandwich Range, where we used to do a lot of hiking and camping. And my friend Arthur Balderaki, do you know Arthur? I've heard of him. He yeah, he was the head of the art department at UNH, sculptor, draftsman. Um, he kept saying, Chris, you've got to go up to Mount Agamedicus. And wait, not Mount Agamedicus, Schmedicus. No. <laughs> we went up there about two months ago. And absolutely just this wonderful place. It's just so magical and so interesting. We can see the mountains we used to climb. If you get a clear day, you can see Washington. You can see Chicago, which is one of our favorite mountains. Pagas, Whiteface. So, I started talking to my artist friends. I said, well, so hot. no one's doing paintings of Agamedicus. And it's got all kinds of historical and uh, geological interests and animal interests. I said, come on, let's get a show together. Okay. So I've cranked up a bunch of artists' interest in this idea. And I don't know what's going to happen. I've suggested it to Mary Harding as a possible exhibition. I think it would be a great exhibition of works of art, plus you could invite the public in to mm -hmm. post their images or their thoughts about this. It's a really oh, interesting place. Yeah. The other thing that's really interesting about Agamedicus, it's not owned by a state entity. It is actually owned by about seven or eight different principal owners, and they've been able to work out strategies and, and uh, support systems to keep it going and open to the public. 
Wonderful. Very it's a cool. good seed of an idea. Yes, I want to hear more about it, and hopefully okay. it comes to fruition. And this is a time in our program when we ask you to reach into the bowl and pick next week's guest. All right. You get to do the honors. And the winner is... <laughs> Best Actress in a Musical, Jennifer Batchelder, Annie, Rochester Opera House. There we go. All right. So that will be our next guest. And you might get to sit in again sometime. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, right. thank, thank you, you very much. You